Hello to everyone. Welcome. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, my name is Ricardo, Ricardo Grassi. I'm uh, from Argentina. I was born in Argentina. I lived in, in Italy. And for the last more or less 18 years, I've been mainly working in Afghanistan. Hmm? Uh, I'm the Director General of the Citizens Platform on Climate Change and the Sustainable World, which is an independent uh, uh, platform um, dedicated exclusively to information and communication. It's not collateral to any other kind of, 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 of uh, activities. That's why it's made of journalists, uh, communicators, artists, graphic designers, photographers, all people that has to do with the, the scope of communicating and reporting properly. Mm -hmm. um, on that we have, since uh, the beginning, I, and this was launched last year, the support of uh, UNESCO's communication and information sector. So what we are doing now is a joint activity with UNESCO that uh, within the framework of the COP26, uh, though the spirit is to continue afterwards. Hmm? I mean, COP serves, gives up an opportunity for more visibility and impact, but then COPs finish and life continues. So the, the aim of uh, empowering youth voices and to upgrade the participation of youth, I mean, knowledgeable youth, and uh, uh, um, in that we coincide with UNESCO, and it's fundamental to continue moving forward. As it is, uh, this focus on the global south. So all these webinars uh, um, taking place in uh, South Asia, Africa, Latin America, and uh, and this Spanish-speaking Caribbean, and then the, the small island states uh, in development. Uh, we do that because uh, there's far less uh, information about the global south that, uh, than what we are getting from, from the north regarding climate change solutions, climate change activities, climate change practices. Hmm? Uh, this latter words are because our approach is to show what is available, what is possible to be done immediately, and in that way to exercise a sort of a pressure on decision makers to move into implementing quickly existing solutions and to uh, help themselves to cope with the enormous interests that try to stop the implementation of existing solutions. So our approach is like positive and not only uh, or not basically the attitude that is being done fortunately by many others, which is pointing problems and pointing what, uh, what is urgent and, and, and that. I mean, we know that. Uh, on this, the youth teenagers movement basically on um, Fridays for Future has been extremely uh, useful and still is. In making that climate change uh, is no longer an opinion but a fact. Mm? So uh, I will introduce uh, each one of you, uh, and 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 you start developing the the theme that you wanted to to talk about because it's one issue per person. Then we will have time to go to other things. Um, so. Uh, we are waiting for the third person that has communication connectivity problems. Hopefully, we'll arrive later. Uh, so, uh, we are here, Christian Zakur and Shanika John, together with myself and Alessandra Bonanomi, which is a member of the Citizens Platform on Climate Change. So, I will uh, start with uh, Christian. Uh, that is the small island uh, developing uh, states regional facilitator for the United Nations Environment Programme, major group of children and youth. That is a network platform open for all young people around the world who want to engage in a policy design uh, that, uh, at, at the UNEP. Uh, 
Christiane has been passionate about the environment from a young age. She pursued a bachelor's degree in environmental science and is currently undertaking her master in biodiversity, conservation and sustainable development at the University of the West Indies and volunteers with several local NGOs. Christiane is passionate about environment, go, um, environmental governance and climate justice and she's based in Tobago. So um, your topic of choice has been water and climate change and please go ahead with it. I'm just going to turn my headphones off because I'm getting feedback. I chose to speak on water because water is a key, um, a key component of our life in the Caribbean and in fact all over the world because it's so essential to our way of life. Um, it's an essential element of services which support poverty reduction, economic growth and environmental sustainability. And to the entire world, it's pivotal to global food security as an integral resource sustaining agriculture and it's critical to, to energy security and industrial development since it's used for cooling, power production and related industrial technologies. Water availability is also integral to improving social well-being and equity and to fostering inclusive growth. Given its key role in the maintenance of environmental health, this resource is central to the growth and well-being of societies all around the world. Um, climate change is becoming a problem and um, it's placing pressure on um, it's placing pressure on our drinking water supplies, our food production, property values by these simple mechanisms of things like rising air temperatures, water evaporation, um, storms and droughts can affect our groundwater, it can affect our above water supplies, it can cause salt water, salt water intrusion in our aquifers. It's very um, intrusive, I would say. In the islands, say in the Caribbean, it's anticipated to have major impacts on groundwater and surface water. In the case of groundwater, as I was saying, I just summarize, changing rainfall intensity due to climate change could reduce groundwater recharge during periods of heavy, extremely heavy rainfall, since much of this water dissipates to runoff. At the same time, drought conditions could also result in extreme water extraction from aquifers, both through use and surface evaporation, ultimately affecting both water availability and groundwater quality. In the case of surface water, climate change can induce high levels of evaporation from surface reservoirs, rapid runoff during heavy rainfall, and filtration to groundwater sources. In the governance sense, the Caribbean is facing challenges related to wastewater management and growing intersectoral water competition, as it struggles to provide improved housing and other public infrastructure while sustaining economic growth. With respect to public infrastructure, improved water distribution systems will be necessary to reduce the high level of water loss through leakage, the management of wastewater as a water recycling strategy is also critical in this regard. Water use efficiency in the tourism sector will also require attention, given the implications for both financial and environmental sustainability for the region's most dynamic economic sector. Guests use a lot of water, and without a steady supply of fresh water, there is little opportunity for, for tourism growth, and resorts and hotels in the region also frequently have problems treating and discharging their wastewater without damaging the pristine beaches and ecosystems that draw tourists. As I've stated, water is one of the most fundamental components of human life on Earth. Access to water is a human right, and yet billions around the world are still faced with daily challenges accessing even the most basic of services. For us in the Caribbean with our small island developing states, where climate, climate change related pressures such as drought and extreme weather compound the existing geographic, industrial and in infrastructural pressures, water scarcity is a way of life that, cover, that colors several facets of our lives. Water demand is expected to increase by nearly 30% by 2050, mostly due to industrial development, thus creating an urgent need for innovations that can help supplement the dwindling volume of available fresh water in a sustainable and scalable fashion. People like myself are now stepping up to deal with the scarce resource in innovative and groundbreaking ways. According to the Global Water, Global water Partnership, Caribbean, Wastewater represents a large stock of untapped resources, which, if treated and reused for secondary purposes, can lead to less reliance on freshwater resources and increased availability for storage. Poorly managed wastewater leads not only to loss of ecosystem services and economic opportunities, but also to climate change. 
through wastewater related emissions of methane and nitrous oxide, which have higher global warming potentials than carbon dioxide. There are also likely health impacts due to waterborne diseases, as well as the challenge of the spread of dead zones on our coastlines, impacting fisheries, livelihoods, and the food chain. On the other hand, well-managed wastewater can yield many benefits, mostly for agriculture, because it's so full of nutrients. It's a source of water and nutrients that can be used for crop production, reducing the need for scarce fresh water and expensive fertilizers. Wastewater sludge can also be used to manufacture construction materials and to generate biogas and biofuel, thus providing opportunities for green jobs, sustainable development, and social well-being. So wastewater has a lot of potential as, um, as a value-added product. Over the past decade, moving on to desalination now, 68 new desalination plants have been built across the region with a capacity of 782,000 cubic meters of purified water per day but it doesn't come with all these challenges. The environmental risks re related to desalination plants are higher than we originally thought, the most obvious of which relates a huge amount of energy, tripping up myself. The most obvious of which relates a huge amount of energy consumption and damage to marine ecosystems, as well as through the production of toxic byproducts, such as brine that are pumped back into the ocean. Another process that, um, base promise is atmospheric water generation. It's a process that extracts, filters, sterilizes, and stores water directly from vapor that exists in the air. It's a more environmentally sustainable alternative to desalination, and has generated a great deal of buzz in scientific and water circles, especially with respect to systems that are fueled by solar energy as opposed to fossil fuels. It results in significant savings in water, water supply costs, as well as national costs of treatment, transportation, and storage. The specific humidity of tropical environments is ideal for this process. It's been documented in Puerto Rico, post Hurricane Maria, and um, there is a new facility being proposed for Grand Turk. Water saving mechanisms do not always come from large infrastructure projects. Rainwater harvesting is a long established and reliable technique of collecting rainwater for domestic use. It's currently being promoted across the Caribbean region as a key, low cost and low technology water supply augmentation method. It's seen as a means to improve resilience to water, water related climate impacts at both national and community level. While it used to be prevalent in the past, there's, there are only around 500,000 persons currently in the Caribbean who depend at least partially on RWH. The vast majority of the Caribbean's population depend on centralized pipe borne municipal water water supplies derived from surface water, groundwater, or desalination. But given climate impacts, there is now a concerted effort to reintroduce the RWH culture in the Caribbean as one option to reduce water security concerns. In particular, it's seen as a viable means to augment existing water supplies after disaster events, when access to municipal water supplies may be disrupted. One of the challenges, main challenges, in mainstreaming this technique in the Caribbean is that it's considered an outdated practice alongside the stigma of being practiced solely by low income groups. Regional organizations such as the Global Water Partnership Caribbean are trying to overcome this negative perception through the development and promotion of suitable knowledge products, including technical publications, videos, and models. Um, the last technique, technique I will touch on is more of a holistic process, integrated water resource management. It's a process which promotes the coordinated development and management of water, land, and related resources in order to maximize economic and social welfare in an equitable manner without compromising the sustainability of vital ecosystems and the environment. Several Caribbean nations to date have developed or drafted IWRM roadmaps or action plans. With tourism being the dominant sector across the Caribbean, there's a lot of potential for IWRM and sustainable tourism as took place in Jamaica. In Jamaica, um, let me just pull up my notes from this. Find it. I can make it this. Basically, there are water, water saving uh, methods implemented, such as um, low pressure shower heads. And um, over time, there are actually returns of, I think it was 961 US dollars per room. So it's ultimately very profitable and water saving. Small island states should be natural promoters of the concept of IWRM. In small islands, there is no upstream or downstream conflict since we are all downstream. The short flow distances to the sea and the economic role that the sea plays in our lives, both for recreation and for food, 
makes it imperative that we adopt an approach which is holistic. And that is the end of my presentation. I didn't bother with a snappy conclusion because we're going to be talking about this. Back to you. Good. Thank you very much. Tell me something, please. This, uh, it seems that uh, the intervention that is taking place uh, counts on the citizens' initiative, but supported by uh, inter-regional inter organizations that are what? Intergovernmental, governmental, or, or I mean, this IWR that you mentioned, uh, is it it's a, a governmental entity or uh, I would like to get a better idea and offer a better idea of the support that you are receiving to implement uh, solutions. I mean, financial supports and technical or advice or whatever. Hmm. This is just related to IWRM. Hmm. Um, okay, so it seems to me like it's mainly a top-down process. It's being transmitted to the public by these centralized agencies like the GWPC. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And bottom top, uh, you, you, you don't have or you don't know? I don't know. <laughs> OK, OK. No, but it's very, very interesting. I mean, further on, I think it would be useful to, uh, to convey this, to share this in details, no? because it's uh, useful, or at least that's our aim, to show ways of doing things, no? I mean, and so going into, even in a didactic way and to see the problems face, how we're resolved and so on. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you very much. And uh, now uh, we'll move to uh, Shanika John. That, uh, well, I, I, I did not receive your bio or your resume so I would have to ask you to introduce yourself. I, I know, yes, of your particular relation with uh, climate change uh, linked to health and, uh, and, and stress. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, tell us more briefly, briefly about you and uh, the topic you will be talking about, please. Hmm? Good morning, everyone. My name is Shanika John, and I'm from the beautiful island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I am professionally employed with the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment in St. Vincent and the Grenadines as a health promotion specialist with specific responsibility for risk communication, dissemination of information, as well as during normal operation hours and even during an emergency at the national level. I am also one of the recent um, fellows for the Climate Change and Health um for collaboration with ue and the eu funded so i'm currently going through that process as one of the climate change and health fellow and i am so happy to be here with you this morning the area of focus that i'm going to talk about this morning is the integration of health in climate change i think it's one of the most important areas that we should consider in the fight for climate change and very often it is overlooked so I hope that by the end of this presentation that I would have at least given you some insight to some of the things that you really should consider when talking about climate change. Very often we talk about climate change, whether in the developing countries or the small developing countries, and we tend to leave out some of the issues, key things that are directly related to health. I think at this point in, in our fight in climate change, it is clearly evident that health and climate change should be considered together. WHO has indicated that climate change has occurred since in the mid 1970s and could already account for annually over 150,000 deaths. About 500 of those are disability adjusted life years, mainly within those in the developing countries. This is also an area for concern, especially if most of those small developing states, this is our population. For example, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, my population is estimated to be 110,000 people. And so this is very alarming when you start to see increasing number of deaths, specifically related to the effects of climate change, but more so having a health effect on the population. Whether we like it or not, whether we agree with it or not, the effects of climate change and natural or human-made health stressors tend to affect our daily function. 
even in our current situation in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen instances where the overwhelming concern of our health system and even within our population has caused a significant triggers and stressors resulting in overburn, resulting in deaths and resulting in injury and even in some cases, misplacement. The evidence has clearly shown as well that there's a growing threat as it relates to our public health measures where climate change are concerned. We talk about food security. Um, my colleague before spoke about water. Water security is also one of the major concerns and the emerging and re-emerging of health diseases are also of a threat. Just a few years ago last year, the Caribbean witnessed what is called to be the second wave in terms of the increasing number of dengue cases that was ever recorded. I know specifically for St. Vincent and the Grenadines, it's one of the most frightening experience where we started to see people actually losing their lives because of complications or associations with dengue fever, all of which are directly linked to a change in weather pattern, whether it's more rainfall, a peak in rainfall, or even whether it is an increase in drought that causes a breeding ground for mosquitoes, which then becomes this deadly disease. It is also increasingly important to note that vulnerability to these particular access to services, whether it's injury, diseases, mental health, food security and water security should also be included in the adaptation and mitigation measures associated with climate change. So I urge you, when you are considering and discussing your plans, whether it's a more resilient bridge or a more adaptable housing for persons, I ask you to specifically consider adapting more appropriate adaptation measures that meet your specific population that could not only increase their access and availability to healthcare, but also the inclusion of it for all. At this particular time, for each country, whether you are a developing country or you are also a small island developing state like myself, I ask that you start to integrate health into your climate change measures, as this is very important. It makes no sense having a bridge that could withstand flooding, that could withstand natural disasters, if you have nobody to cross that bridge. Thank you. Thank you very much because it's been very clear, so so specific, so going to the point. Um, actually, I've been, I've been reading and knowing about more things that I would like to read about health, but more particularly on, on uh, eco uh, and climate change uh, anxiety development, no? uh, which is a combination, depending on where you are, of, of uh, uh, objective uh, uh, factors that you that are affecting you directly but also the the kind of information that is being delivered i mean a sort of information that creates anxiety because it's either confusing you or not offering you uh, ways for action no which is uh, the, uh, so it generates a sort of okay feeling threatened and not uh, knowing what what to do. Hmm? And uh, there seems to be a paramount lack of leadership. Uh, mm, I mean, underlining this, uh, as you have uh, done, uh, Shanika, I think it's it's very, very important. Is uh, the, uh, are the, uh, the, uh, the authorities, the, the government, uh, aware or doing something or showing that they are rather aware on this or not in 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 your island or and around you i think more and more the countries within the caribbean specifically and even around the globe um the the more developing states are now seeing the need for the integration um it it, it is at a point where you cannot treat climate change or you cannot try to mitigate the efforts of climate change without thinking of the health of the population and those directly involved. So even when you talk about flooding and you talk about if we're preparing for um, severe weather conditions, you then have to think about how does this particular mm. climate change event or activity affect the health of my population? And so you start to see that whether or not it's a case where the 
the facilities in terms of the healthcare facilities, the accessibility, availability, and, and even the, the services that are being offered at the facilities are not to the standard, then you may have losing persons within your population because people are now seeking care. Because you could imagine in a flooding, let's say, for example, mm. um, we would have increase in number of persons who may have diarrhea, vomiting, and the vulnerable population, you have the children, you have the elderly, we have people who have been probably been displaced without their medication, without their supplies because of all the rush of everything. While we are trying to mitigate and put measures in place to ensure that there is a smooth water flow, to ensure that our bridges can maintain um, whatever is happening, it's also important for us to also divert some of the funds into our healthcare system. To one, ensure that we can adequately respond within a disaster, keeping in mind that our healthcare workers may also be affected during the disaster. So how could you also prepare them to respond while they are also being affected? And so the psychosocial support during um, these different interventions are also important, being able to prepare your team. And I think sometimes we take it for granted, knowing that during a disaster, as a healthcare worker, it's my responsibility to respond. But I was never prepared to respond to myself enough to make me respond to others. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of time there's a delay in terms of the care, and that delay could also be very detrimental to our population. So it's also important to build resilience within our healthcare system, from mental health, from the physical infrastructure, and also the supporting mechanisms. So in some instances, you may lose power for an extended period of time. Can your facility be able to operate within that extended period of time where there is no water and there is no electricity? What are the supporting mechanisms and the adaptation mechanisms that have been put in place to ensure that people can still access the care that they need and to also ensure that healthcare workers are still within a suitable environment to function? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, I was going to I was going to ask you something also, uh, Christian, because I, I I was curious in the in in your topic, I mean water, to to ask you if uh, apart from the problem of, of uh, water, the lack of water, then but then problems linked to water in itself because of there is that intersection. You can really see how climate change is a cross cross cutting issue because if you don't have water. Because of climate change, you can't wash your hands, you can't sanitize. And um, I also wanted to comment on you, Shanika, before I forget. Um, there is a huge stigma around mental health in the Caribbean. The idea being that if you have to seek help for something that you can't see, it means that you are inherently damaged. If you're going for therapy, it means there's something wrong with you. It's pretty rough. And so even with that, the messaging has to be specific. Um, to sort of move people away from that. So it's not even about being able to seek care, but it's having systems in place that could not wait for people to tap in, but you tapping into them. So even with our healthcare workers and those particular persons within the vulnerable population, having a system or mechanisms in place where you could even send a reminder message, today is a new day. You are alive, you are doing well, and we will get through this together. Those simple, subtle messages sort of reinforce an, uh, a particular behavior and it channel a particular energy, not only within our healthcare workers, but those directly affected, especially in instances when the news around you is so overwhelming and it's so negative. You know, there's a flood. I possibly lost my home. Um, I probably lost my family. I can't find my siblings. People need to be reassured during this time. And so it's important for us as leaders and as persons who are aspiring to be leaders, even in the fight for climate change, to think about it. And I am very passionate about it because having worked from health, um, and still working in health in particular now, but also still working in climate change, more and more I'm seeing that there has been a significant gap in terms of merging. So I think right now, even for the developing countries, when you start to think about how you want to invest and support small island developing states um, as it relates to climate change, start to consider health as an option. And so that option can go long-term 
current needs of the population and it can also still be relevant in terms of when we do get the effects of climate change because we know that we are the smallest contributors but that does not exclude us from being affected one way or the other and so we need also your help to get us up to that particular standard where we can not only be resilient as people but we can have adaptation mechanisms in the country that allow us to respond so we don't have to always come to you immediately because you've equipped us and you've helped us to get to the point where we can also service our, our people. We can provide the basic care that they need. We can do the things that are needed until you are able to respond accordingly to assist us. Yeah, yeah you're right. You're right. And but it's very important to highlight it. And then everything that means caring, you know, because I mean, there's a sense of, uh, I observe, well, even in myself, and not only in the community or in different places, a sort of solitude, no? I mean, there's uh, problems and uh, you don't feel really, well, you feel few people reacting in ways that would be caring you, no? I mean, caring of you. And the message has to do also with that attitude, I mean, I mean no? Reassure and we are here and we are together and this can be done and and to do it you know uh, it's uh yesterday we were discussing about this it has to do with with uh, directly with my kind of activity you know as, as, a, as, a, as a journalist or a writer is uh, uh, how you communicate you no know? i mean choosing the words and then being very specific and very direct because otherwise you just create confusion and the confusion creates solitude because uh, I mean another day uh, this, this week I was listening to another discussion and there was an audience saying one of the problems today is that there are no grown-up persons telling youth what to do what they could do and so youth are trying to react, feeling that they have to say what is to be done because the, those that are supposed to be conducting don't know what to say, no? And, uh, and it was in a TV show and I was surprised that this person was saying that because there are different ways of censorship, no? Everything seems to be normal. Good. I think yes, that... I, I agree with you and even um, in specific to the messaging for young people, um, I know sometimes it may be a bit overwhelming, especially in instances where you feel as if you do not have the national support or political um, will support in country. And political will doesn't necessarily have to mean government. It could be from ministries or sectors. Yeah. And so I want you to start to think about your specific target group and what are the specific messages that you can develop to reach your target group. Um, so I don't want you to sit and wait to get support to take action. Take action and allow your action to allow people to find you. So I'm seeing this flyer from this particular group of organization and a minister will say, can you find out who is working with this group? Can you tell me who is the contact? But if you sit and you wait for them to assist you to move, you may never be able to move in the immediate instance. So within your network, within your grouping, see how you can take action to give you one visibility and to meet your specific target group. I remember working with a, a group of young people who wanted to do something with the heat because it's really hot these days. Um, and so we are feeling that even here in the Caribbean and they wanted to do something to target people, young people, to encourage people to drink more water. And they were coming back and forth with different ministries and different organizations asking for support. And then they got connected to me and I said to them, so what's your plan? What do you want to do? So take out the different ministries, take out the different sectors. What's your message? And so they were able to create a flyer that says, beat the heat, drink up. You had your reusable water bottle, not a plastic bottle, because we have to make the message very clear. So reusable water bottle, drinking up, and the flyer went viral. And before you know it, they were approached by a number of different water companies asking if they wanted to collaborate, to distribute waters, to come mm -hmm. to groups, mm -hmm. to schools, to different organizations. So don't sit and wait. And don't be discouraged if you feel as if you're not getting the support. It happens. But don't let that stop you from making the decision and for taking specific action. Because your action is what is going to drive people to you. 
Exactly, that's how it is. And um, I love your background sounds, by the way. <laughs> this is right. I mean, your background, Chanika, there's a background there, very alive, and I enjoy it. <laughs> okay, Christian, Island life. <laughs> Christian, do you have uh, anything that you would like to ask Chanika or, or to me or to Alessandra? Or, I mean, Just that so I'd like to hire Chanika as a motivational speaker. But, um, <laughs> I do, I resonate with what you say because um, I've come to realize in activism because I'm engaging with a lot of local groups, I'm engaging with groups online, we're campaigning for COP26. Um, you have two branches of people who become activists. You have people who are experiencing it. They're in free, they're experiencing themselves. And then you have people who go into it because they are academics or they're in science and they're seeing proof and they have evidence to show that something has to be done. And um, it seems to me that when you have people who are experiencing it, but they don't have the academic proof to back it up, and they try to make changes, mm. they are treated as lesser beings. They're put down because they don't know what they're talking about. They're not scientists. Mm -hmm. And there's a disconnect because when you bring your experience. I It was 34 degrees Celsius throughout this week. It was hot. Mm. But um, if I went to COP26 and I made the statement that things are feeling hot, we are having more storms, um, things are changing, we need to do something about it, I would be put down. And this is the reality for a lot of climate activists. They are receiving this message from the people who are supposed to be listening. And it's yeah. making them feel agitated. And it just goes into a negative... Mm. Well, it's more like a positive feedback cycle to bring in the climate metaphor. Mm, and mm, mm. Can't remember where I was going with this. I had a point to make. Mm. Where was I going with this? <laughs> <laughs> well, it happens. <laughs> I think you're you probably going along the line that um, in in preparation for it, the groups um, were getting some difficulties with different stakeholders and so forth. I can't remember, but it's taking time. What's <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, also, uh, when I say yesterday, it was with the, this was in Milan, no, the the pre COP uh, summit, and so. Um, long of a lot of young people came, and so we organized things. I, I went to to Milan yesterday, and then, I'm, I'm in Rome you know, now, at home. Uh, but uh, we so we have like uh, seminars and conversations, and and one thing because it's the things I tried to follow up, and there's a fantastic fantastic research that was delivered at the beginning of this year on on disinformation and fake news, no. And part of this, it's demonstrated in the research, includes uh, this depressing information. Hmm? Saying, oh, well, there's no solution. Uh, uh, things, are, things are not going to work, or this is going to be useless, uh, and that. No? Which is, uh, impacts very, very negatively. Together with saying, well, the scientists are wrong or are not reliable and, and, and this other thing. So there's an entire systematic uh, uh, kind of propaganda, let's say, uh, against the things that all of those engaged uh, on, 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 on the climate change threaten uh, must know and know how to, how to counteract that kind of message because it impacts it impacts very negatively so um i think we will have to continue this uh, more and more and we will be organizing uh unless you would have more things to to say and to add i'm sorry that the other two that we were expecting were unable to connect but uh, we will try to resolve it uh, and at least to to organize another webinar with those that have been missing, but uh, this one I'm particularly happy because it's concrete, concise, and, and attractive, interesting. No? Uh, and we were able to, yeah, to talk among ourselves, which is very good. So thank you very much again, and uh, we will keep in contact and doing 
hopefully things together more and more. Goodbye.